this uh, this landscape, this waterway that asks to be physically encountered. You know that it it's asking for the body to be with it and to know it in a physical way. From the river to the valley to the sea. Welcome to the Mississippi Valley Traveler Podcast. I'm Dean Klinkenberg, and I've been exploring the deep history and rich culture of the people and places along America's greatest river, the Mississippi, since 2007. Join me as I go deep into the characters and places along the river, and occasionally wander into other stories from the Midwest and other rivers. Read the episode show notes and get more information on the Mississippi at MississippiValleyTraveler.com. Let's get going. Welcome to episode 10 of the Mississippi Valley Traveler podcast. In this episode, I had the pleasure of talking with Victoria Bradford Sturbicki about her remarkable feat from 2019 in which she ran the length of the Mississippi River. Uh, obviously, the first question I have to ask is, what were you thinking? Uh, so, yeah, we get into that. I'll ask her a little bit about her inspiration uh, for for wanting to run the length of the river. Uh, but uh, there are two aspects to this story that I think you'll find inter- interesting. One is obviously the physical part, how she prepared and managed uh, the physical challenges related to running so much and running every day. But the second part of her project is she wanted to listen to people's stories. Uh, And in the course of the four months she was uh, she ran the river, she interviewed about 600 people about their lives, uh, about their stories uh, related to the Mississippi River. The first uh, set of stories uh, she'll be releasing on November 1st, Chapter 1, focuses on people from the Headwaters region. I'll post a link in the show notes uh, where you can uh, check that out, and I hope you will. A quick shout out to Patreon supporters, as usual, for continuing to show love to the podcast. If you would like to show some love as well, go to patreon.com slash Dean Klinkenberg and you can make a contribution there. Now let's get on to the interview. Victoria Bradford Sturbicki is an artist and cultural producer working across the lines of public art, dance, social practice, and installation. Bradford currently works as executive and artistic director of A House Unbuilt, a nonprofit organization focused on movement research. She refers to the work she does there as social choreography, moving people both physically and conceptually toward greater connectivity. This work relies on collaboration from other artists, as well as research institutes, environmental organizations, political organizations, art organizations, governments and government agencies, individual citizens, and communities at large across the United States, particularly as witnessed in Relay of Voices. Bradford studied visual arts, anthropology, and theology at the University of Notre Dame, and visual arts and performance at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Welcome to the podcast, Victoria. Thanks, Dean. It's good to be here. Uh, It is such a treat to have some time to really talk in depth with you about uh, your project, Relay of Voices. And I'm not exactly sure where it makes the most sense to begin. Should we talk first about a house and built or should we talk about Relay of Voices? Um, Where would you like to begin? I guess we can talk about a house I'm built and just kind of explain the background of, of the work that I do. Sounds good. So give us an idea about, you know, what a house and built main focus is and, and what that looks like. Sure. So um, a house and built started out really with a basis in movement, um, but movement that's rooted in landscapes and situations. So I uh, started out as a, a choreographer, a dancer, um, a, a visual artist, someone who was responding to my environment and my situation and making artworks that uh, landed not often in a gallery or a museum, but often right back in those environments where I was inspired from. So out on the city street, out uh, in a garden, out on a pier along the Mississippi, 
um, in these different spaces, uh, finding that this real connection with these, these landscapes and these environments. And eventually I started to realize that, you know, being a part of these situations and these environments was also an opportunity to listen to the people who were in those spaces and to tell their stories as well, um, that they, those were kind of connected to the landscapes and the environments that they were in. And so uh, the stories uh, started to become, uh, you know, full of words, not just movements. And, and the work became more complex. And so it wasn't uh, that dance, dance became something that was social and engaged in, in communities. And I started to think about how this was not just putting performances um, in the way of people's sight, you know, something to witness, but it was more of a research effort of looking at the movement in people's lives, looking at how people's behaviors and their actions and the stories that they tell through the way they live their lives, um, you know, is something we can connect to and learn from. And that that can kind of build bridges across some of the boundaries we're experiencing in the world. And so I started to build projects uh, that that did that or that that kind of tapped into those resources. So um, some of those projects were like a, a project I have that's focused on bringing people together over a meal, doing dinners, um, having people share over long durations of time uh, that meal and kind of engage in conversation and suss things out um, through creative experiences. And then, of course, like relay of voices, um, you know, traveling down the river, having dialogue with people, sharing those stories as we travel, turning those stories into other stories and, you know, reconnecting with those people many times. There's a lot of iteration in the work that I do where you take something, you do something, it becomes something else and it becomes something else again. Um, so there's never just uh, one time with a material. Um, you can think of that as a, you know, a physical material, but also as the the lived material, like a story or, or like an encounter with a person. So I've been doing this work for, you know, 12 years now, maybe longer, and formed a nonprofit, a house I'm built in order to kind of house the work and to support the work by being able to raise money, you know, through grants and individual donors to do these different projects. Some of them are large and some of them are small. And um, that's really, that's really helped to get things off the ground. Fantastic. So the idea of movement is central to your work. Could you just explain a little bit about how you define movement, why that play such a central role in what you're interested in? So while I use words a lot, especially in this new project, writing, um, I, I always go back to the body that I think there is language or there's knowledge housed in the body and the way that we move and the way that we sense our environments um, that is only housed in the body, that there's a way of knowing through the body that comes before language. And I think that it's important to tap into that. And a lot of it comes from simple movement, even just a breath, or the way we open and close our eyes in the morning. It doesn't mean doing a turn or a leap or splitting your legs open or whatever, you know, in, a, in some kind of dramatic dance movement. But just the, the simple ways we move our body and being tuned into that and, you know, how it kind of changes the way we interact with other people and with ourselves and the energy we have every day. And and then how that interacts with the words that come out of our mouths um, and how that changes and shifts the way we communicate. 
with ourselves and with each other. And so I think there's all this energy that's housed in the body and that we become sometimes alienated from it because we're on screens, because we're gabbing, we're talking, and that it's important to reconnect with the body and all that energy and that knowledge that's housed there uh, because we can learn new things about ourselves and about kind of a, a big, an origin of ourselves and an or, original way of, of, you know, kind of how we came into being and how we connect with each other. And that gets to our rootedness, uh, you know, and maybe possibly how we can get over some of the, the kind of tensions and divisiveness that we've created. And that's just something I personally believe in and feel. I don't have any proof. I don't have any proof. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, if I'm kind of understanding it right, it sounds like um, there's this idea that we experience things maybe on a physical level that we aren't necessarily uh, acutely conscious of, or don't necessarily aren't necessarily part of our our, uh, our mental awareness. But they're there. We, you know, it's another way of kind of experiencing the world, and you're trying to kind of tap into that and help bring out some of that, uh, and bring you know bring some light in to help people maybe may be a little more aware of what their body is telling them about how they're experiencing the world. Is that one aspect of this? Definitely. I I also think one of the things I'm doing is using the body as a place to kind of reprocess things that we do with words or, uh, you know, with technology. And so kind of like using the body as a tool to unpack some of what we've packed in and layered. Um, so I create these, you know, dances or these, these movement experiences where hopefully that can show something that we've kind of hidden and that creates a space for new knowledge and new experience. And then I not only do that in my own body, but I try to create opportunities for other people to have those same experiences, whether that's through workshops, through storytelling experiences or, or community gatherings, you know, through through a kind of immersive performance where people are engaged and they don't realize they're having a movement moment, but they're having a movement moment, things like that. Fantastic. Uh, there are just so many different ways we can experience the world. And I think this is one area where, you know, particularly in our culture today, we just don't pay much attention to our bodies as much and what our bodies are trying to tell us. Um, so it sounds like your work is, you know, part of it is certainly helping to uh, increase awareness of that and help people get in touch with that and learn from what their bodies are trying to, to say. I think that's that's exactly it. And I think when we get to the project and talking about the river um, and how it's a, a physical environment, it's this, uh, this landscape, this waterway that asks to be physically encountered, you know, that it, it's asking for the body to be with it and to know it in a physical way. Um, you know, that you can read about it, you can look at the statistics about what's happening to our, you know, to our river, whether it's in the industry or water, clean water, or all those things, you can know it in a variety of different ways. But if you know it by being, you know, on the landscape, in the water, there's such a different uh, experience and taking the time to soak that in uh, really changes things. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a that's a nice transition. So let's get into that a little bit then. Uh, relay of voices. So 
at some point, I don't know, you woke up some morning and you decided, I want to run 2,500 miles along the Mississippi River. <laughs> how, how did the work? Tell me about how this idea came to you, uh, the genesis of this. Well, it is kind of like that. I, um, I've never been an athlete. I wasn't a runner. But I started running about six years ago because I needed a exercise. Like I needed to start exercising more because I wasn't dancing as much as I used to. I changed, you know, I stopped a, pro- a big project I was doing and I needed a daily practice. I just needed something simple. Um, you know, going to the gym would, was expensive. <laughs> um, running, you could just put on tennis shoes and walk out the door, hit the pavement. So I asked a friend of mine who was a triathlon coach to kind of give me a plan and help me not hurt myself, you know, because I'm clumsy and I was bound to injure myself. And so he, he ended up being my trainer. And after a few weeks of running every day and starting to get into this kind of meditative space, you know, with running and feeling like really just at home and coming to know the streets of Chicago, which is where I was living at the time in a whole new way, I started to really learn the landscape. You know, I had been walking the streets of Chicago for a long time, but as I ran the streets and I ran further than I had ever walked, I, you know, I went into new neighborhoods. I, I kind of explored. I just fell in love with this rhythm that was kind of coursing through my body. And I thought I need to do something with this. Like I need to make art with this because anytime something like connects with me in that way, I, I feel like I need to do something significant with it. Right. And, um, the thing that made sense for me at the time was to run home to Louisiana because I had been living in Chicago for about 10 years and I had really been struggling ever since around the BP oil spill, which was several years prior, but with the sense of like, why am I here and not there helping my state, like being a part of that conversation, which is a really complicated conversation, um, you know, and participating in some way to make a difference in the community and my, where my family lives, where my family is struggling. And where is my home? Um, and so I thought, well, I, I, I titled the project Running Home. It was going to be called Running Home. And I was going to run, you know, from Chicago down the Chicago River to the Mississippi River. I was going to run home. And then I started, you know, took time thinking about it. And I realized that the Mississippi River is like the the backbone of our nation. And it's also the waterway that shapes my state, Louisiana. It is it is what forms the boot. (laughs) And um, for better or for worse considering what's happening with subsidence and how people are trying to or not harness the river water to rebuild land and all of those complicated conversations. So where in Louisiana did you grow up? I grew up on the southwest side of the uh, boot in uh, Lake Charles, so the heel of the boot. Uh, and when you were when you were growing up, was the you know, what I guess what what role did water or the Mississippi play in your life when you were growing up? So I grew up in Lake Charles, but my family is really from kind of all along the coastal area. My dad 
grew up in Baton Rouge. His family is from New Orleans. My mom is from a small town in Lafouche Parish on uh, Bayou Lafouche called Cutoff. Um, and her dad was a trapper. Um, we grew up fishing every summer on Grand Isle, a barrier island, kind of off the coast at the, the toe of the boot. Um, and I saw Grand Isle every summer change. You know, some years we would have a beach. Some years you would see new, like, apparatus for erosion, you know, whether it was these, like, kind of, they looked like amphitheater kind of structures or it was Christmas trees or it was a new jetty put in or, you know, all these different structures to try to prevent the erosion. And some years there would be a great beach and then other years that there had been a hurricane and it was all washed away and it was, you know, but always it wasn't like a Florida beach. It was, a you know, salty, smelly, dead fish. You could see the oil rigs, you could see the shrimp boats. And we surf fished early in the morning out in the water. And, you know, my mom always said we were a water people. And, and definitely, you know, that I grew up, I learned how to clean a fish from my grandmother in this little like fish cleaning hut there in Grand Isle. You know, they lived on the bayou side. So the next, the next time I'm going fishing, you're coming with me to show me how to clean what I catch if I catch anything at all. But <laughs> right. I mean, it's uh, so many of my family members still live down there in Lafouche Parish. And several of my cousins were boat captains, you know, pilots on the Mississippi. Um, so even though my mom ended up moving over to Lake Charles, which still has a strong relationship with the waters of the Gulf and what's going on in those industries, um, we still spent a lot of time close to the Mississippi. And uh, so that's what I kind of realized. And I also realized that as I would run down the length of the river, I would be intersecting all these communities that also had a relationship to the river and people who made their home along the river and I could learn from them why <laughs> why did they make a home on the river you know what's their relationship to that place and so I realized it it wasn't just about my story you know it was just kind of where it started it it really was about kind of stepping outside of my story and listening very deeply to all these other stories that I might encounter. And that through that listening, I might come to know something. And it's, it was listening with my body as I ran the landscape of the river, as I spent physically time with these people moving through their days. Um, that I would learn and know that was the theory. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get to how it and whether or not it lived up to that in a minute. So, all right. So you had you, you, this idea coalesced, you decided you were going to run the length of the Mississippi. What did you do? You know, did you have to, how did you prepare for that physically? Well, so like I said, I had this friend who was a coach and uh, he stayed with me uh, as my coach, getting me running more and more miles, um, doing strength training, 
uh, eventually I started cycling, uh, which I hadn't ever done. I was always kind of a hazard on a bicycle. Um, I had wrecked several, but it was important to have a side plan that if I couldn't run, I could bike. Um, and so I was running every day. I was cycling every day. I was doing strength training. I was swimming. Um, I was pretty religious about it. I was in the best shape of my life. I wish I was in that good of shape now. Um, I went through a couple of injuries in the process, you know, learning where my weaknesses were, which I think is really important because as a dancer, my body is built in a, such a way to be very flexible um, and a runner is more tight. Um, and you have different kind of muscle groups that are kind of like prioritized. And so I had to work maybe harder to be able to run longer distances, you know, and, and to keep up that kind of endurance. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, originally, the the project kind of went through several iterations and i it was called relay of voices because i thought i would have several people running i thought i would have communities running and we did have people run with us along the way but i envisioned masses <laughs> running <laughs> yes <laughs> Um, and I also envisioned this group of dancers like myself running and breaking up the distances into kind of reasonable chunks and this group of us going out and interviewing people in this movement research style. But it turned out that, uh, it was hard to get these other people to kind of commit to taking four months off of life uh, and, you know, committing to a training plan and things like that. So in the end, it turned out that it was going to be just me. And that seemed almost impossible. So uh, my husband said he would join me. And we would do it as a two-person relay. And that's how it worked out. So as a, a relay then, did that mean like you would run one day, he would run another day? Or like, was that part of the structure of it? It meant uh, I would run part of the way. And then he would run part of the way. So say take the day from Nauvoo to Warsaw. Uh, he ran out of Nauvoo, and I ran into Warsaw. So I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the logistics and the like the physicality of this, but I am curious about it because you know it's one thing to train to run a marathon, for example. You but you run those twenty six miles and then you're done. But you're looking at running a couple, well, twenty three hundred miles over the course of four months. Um, so I imagine as you got into that, like there must've been times when your body was not always happy that you were going to try to run a few more miles that day, or there must've been days like that. Yeah. I mean, when we got into the driftless area, some of the hilly areas, I had a tendency to go out too fast like and not expect the landscape and not prepare myself you know not kind of pace myself um and i would peter out sometimes like i would and tom would have to take over and i could like pick up later on 
and come back, you know, so we would have to relay several times, <laughs> um, you know, because I tended to be a little speedy, but I didn't always prepare for that, th those hills. It got better when we were in Louisiana, when it was just flat. <laughs> but, um, and then, you know, we did have bikes with us. So for those long days from like, uh, oh, where was it? East St. Louis to Prairie to Rocher. That was like a 56 mile day. We, we rode bikes. Uh, we ran out of East St. Louis and ran into Prairie to Rocher, but for the intervening miles, we rode the bike. Uh, and it was not easy even riding the bike because it was a headwind and it was a, a still tough, you know, still like doing a biathlon. Um, but you know, so that, that help, um, at least helps your joints and things like that. So it sounds like for, you kind of had a structure set up for yourself where you're trying to get a particular place every day. Is that about That's right? That's right. We had 104 communities and, uh, every day was planned in terms of where we were going. We had, I think, 14 communities that we stayed two days, and the rest of them we only stayed one day. So it was 120 days total. Um, and in each community, we had some planned interactions, uh, people that we had coordinated with to you know, interview and spend time with, and some community events that we had coordinated. And then we had some unplanned interactions that happened. Uh, but I had done, spent like, you know, two and a half years in advance planning this, reaching out to communities. I had visited all the communities in advance, uh, spent time with people to make sure that they knew who I was, what I was hoping to do, you know, and, that we wanted to collaborate. So one of the things jumping out at me from this too is the uh, extraordinary amount of preparation that went into making this work. Um, so uh, obviously the, you know, the centerpiece of this in many ways is the people that you ended up talking with and collecting stories from. Um, so you had a couple of years where you're doing some outreach. I ultimately, how did you decide which people were you were going to to talk with and interview as you traveled down the river? So in each community, we connected with maybe like the mayor's office or the convention and visitors bureau or the arts council or a church or some organization or it was a group or it was like a, a steering committee that came together and we tasked them with coming up with a diverse group of people for us to spend time with. So they came up with a list and we checked that list and said, oh, this looks good or, you know, no, this doesn't look good. Or maybe you should add someone else to the list or you know, we kind of went back and forth about the list. Obviously, they know their community better than we do. And, you know, when it came time to do the interviews and discover who these people really were, we did find that a lot of people gave us their best foot forward. You know, they wanted us to know the city councilman and the, you know, the teacher of the year and the, you know, whatever it is, but everybody has a story and everybody breaks down at a certain point <laughs> um, and tells you who they are and their real feelings. And we spent hours with these people. And um, while we did learn that there were some other stories that, 
we needed to hear or that we should go back and hear. Um, things where people might have even said, close your eyes when you drive by here, don't look there, you know, or just stories they didn't want us to know. Um, we we want to know those stories. We want to know the full picture of a community. Um, but we learned something about that person when they told us that. Um, and we learned something about the community just, just from that moment. And so there was always something to be learned, no matter who they gave us to, to listen to. So in the end, about how many different people do you think you had a chance to talk with and, and interview? I think it's about 600. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and you recorded all that. Yes. So give us a, like a broad sense of the, the experiences the, of people like who, you know, I, obviously we're not going to go name by name, but like in a broad sense, who were the people that participated in this? What was their relationship to the river like? What kind of spectrum of relationships did you come across? Well, uh, I can think about where I'm at on the river writing not right now. Uh, there's a farmer, uh, you know, in Missouri who experienced, you know, a levee breach and flood damage to his home and his farm. Um, there's a, a chemist uh, in Warsaw, Illinois, who worked uh, during the Clean Water Act being a uh, uh, put in place and, you know, was really kind of like span his life spanned the time of that being put in place and working on water quality and, and new restrictions and being very proud of that work to the point of the Trump administration coming in and rolling back uh, restrictions and kind of being devastated by that happening and seeing what change is happening to water quality. Um, but he's, you know, not just a chemist, he's a historian and an amateur archaeologist who found a hidden fort along the shores of the Mississippi River. Um, you know, we spent time at the biological field station up at Itasca. Um, and met with students and the director, Jonathan Schilling there and learned about, you know, everything that they're, the research they're doing there and their relationship to, uh, the water. Um, we met with, uh, an Ojibwe leader in Cass Lake, um, and, you know, talked about the kind of unique situation of the Leech Lake reservation, uh, being kind of, uh, like a chessboard, you know, kind of checkerboard reservation broken up because so many people have sold their allotments, not realizing the value of their land at the time and what she's doing to try to create, uh, value for their people, um, through some new initiatives. And we, uh, met with this really interesting group down in Rosedale, Mississippi, the Rosedale Freedom Project. A young man from the East Coast uh, moved to Rosedale and started this group uh, for young uh, people of color to come and learn about their heritage and the civil rights movement and uh, the original kind of freedom schools and to find a way to have a chance to go to college, um, all kind of rooted in, um, you know, freedom songs and freedom rights, uh, kind of all of these really strong lessons, um, but also like learning new skills and, and video uh, technology, writing poetry, uh, you know, just we met with some of the students themselves and interviewed them and 
talked about their experiences in the community, a very poor part of the Delta. Um, I don't know that there isn't any poor, not poor part of the Delta, um, but uh, we were down in Louisiana uh, meeting with like several coastal activist advocates, uh, Richie Blink, who planted thousands of trees and is also now a parish councilman from Empire, Louisiana, which is disappearing. Um, he's a young guy. He's like my age or younger. Um, it's just like so heartening to see a, a young person like staking their claim on their home like that and like doing that kind of work um, in a community that most people don't even realize they think the river ends at new orleans and there's this whole like 90 miles plaquemines parish you know saint bernard and plaquemines parish that still exists <laughs> and that matters um you know so i don't know i could go on and on there's tons of stories so you met people from a whole bunch of different backgrounds. And a part of this was because of that preparation you you did in advance. You had a chance to uh, build some of those connections right away. You know, we hear so much today about you know how divided Americans are and how hard it is for people to talk to each other. And yet here you traveled through the middle of the country talking to people from very different backgrounds of your own. What do you think are some of the keys to... Uh, having those conversations and connecting with people that are far too easy for us to dismiss otherwise? Um, you mean just for anyone to have those conversations or? Sure. Or maybe what your approach was. Well, I think, you know, we did a presentation just yesterday about two different stories on segregation. One was a story from a black man who had experienced segregation as a youth. And one was from a white woman who had experienced segregation as a youth. Two very different perspectives on segregation. And yet when we encountered both of these stories, we just listened. We didn't judge them. Uh, we didn't offer any uh, remarks to say, Oh God, <laughs> or, <laughs> you know, uh, I think it is giving people a chance to tell their story to that, that their story is worth hearing, um, to, to give them the space and the time to do that. Um, it doesn't mean that we can't all have a position or take a position, you know, at some point when it's appropriate, but to really engage across the perceived boundaries, I think we need to look for the humanity in people. And I think that can always be found and listen for the humanity and recognize when, you know, something you hear is maybe not what you want to hear, but just keep listening because there might be something else that they have to say. Right. And right. that's just part of the conversation. Fundamentally, like there are just times we need to shut up and listen, essentially, right? <laughs> Ex exactly. I let it all come out first, <laughs> you know, uh, before you do that knee jerk reaction, like I've got the answer for you. I've got, I've got to correct you. Um, you know, I, I listened to this one woman and in the moment, like the matter of 
a minute, she talked herself out of being racist. You know, she started being racist and then she talked herself out of it as she was talking. And so let people find their way. Well, let's uh, let's get back to the river, too, because this is the Mississippi Valley Traveler podcast, after all. And I'm curious from your experiences talking with folks and spending four months along the river, uh, what impressions did you come away with about the Mississippi? That it's very different in different places. <laughs> um, you know, like my Mississippi River is levied and dangerous and full of ships and you don't go on a kayak in that river. And yet there's this other river where everybody's like on an island and boating and water skiing and it's like the destination. Um, I mean, that's one thing that was just as a, I think I, I went in totally unexpecting of that, just not, you know, like a t total naive being. Um, also perceptions about water quality. Um, you know, obviously people up at Itasca and the headwaters region felt like their water was clean and pure and, you know, crystal, like just so great. But even further down the river, some people thought their water was great. In La Crosse, people thought we had the best water ever. Um, and, but then you get, you know, further down and, some people don't even think about the water quality because they're not connected to the water um, because there is a barrier. So I think also, you know, the river is, you know, it definitely becomes more industrial more of that that navigation super highway and you know it's it's a transition from kind of the scenic splendor in the headwaters region to to a kind of different riverway um which still has its beauty if you appreciate that you know if you if you understand that's part of our kind of American infrastructure and it's important that we use the river that way, um, or it has become important to the world economy. Um, and, you know, we climbed over the levee, in Carlisle, Louisiana, and stood on the Batcher. And, you know, it's beautiful from that vantage point, even seeing the shipping traffic and everything else. And the woman we were with was like, tear down the levees, let the water run. But, the reality is obviously that's never going to happen. Uh, maybe through a diversion channel, but we won't get the river back to its quote natural state and what its natural state is or what that means. Natural state is debated. Some people think natural state means just you know, with the shipping channel. Um, it depends on who you talk to. If you're enjoying the show, share that love with other people. Leave a review on iTunes or your preferred podcast app. 
Each review makes a difference and helps other fans of the Mississippi River and the Midwest find this show. So tell me again when uh, you did Relay the Voices. I think that was in 2019? 2019. So since then, you've been going back and looking or re-listening to and re- kind of organizing the interviews that you did. I wonder, in that process of re-listening, did it change any of your um, initial impressions as you go back and listen to things? Did what you did your impressions shift at all from what you thought you came away with? Um, I mean, I think they're fuller. I definitely think during the initial journey, there was so little time to process and everything was just kind of on the surface of understanding. So now I'm, I'm listening to every single word and every single thought and I'm able to connect things a lot more between locations, you know, so upriver and downriver and um, see that some of the stories that maybe I thought weren't as meaningful actually have a lot of meat to them um, because I just missed some of those details. I might have been tired that day and I... I wasn't listening as as intently as I should have, but the camera listened, thank goodness, you know, and so that was helpful. I mean, we tried on the journey to, you know, write up as much as possible and to put that up, that on a blog. And I tried to write some individual pieces on particular voices, but it it was very challenging. Our schedule was very tight. Right. It's hard to get a blog post going when you're running 20 miles. Uh, so. <laughs> right. So so as we're recording this, today is October 21st, 2022. You have a big event coming up on November 1st. Uh, tell us what's going on on November 1st. Yeah. So we are launching uh, the new storytelling website. It's interactive, media rich. Uh, And it will contain uh, on November 1st, the first chapter covering the Headwaters region of uh, content that I have been putting together. And and every month following November, I'll be releasing another chapter. Um, There'll be nine chapters in total. So uh, we'll go from headwaters to the gorge to the dripless and on down until we reach the gulf south in july so it's a kind of exciting you can journey along with us once again and um we're really excited because this is the full content it is video footage raw footage from those interviews it is audio clips it is the photos it is you know, first, you know, uh, hand quotes and and material from these people who shared their stories. You know, it is, you know, taken me kind of time to really dig deeply and, and kind of connect the dots between, you know, what they talked about and all the issues facing the river today. And I think even though these stories were gathered, you know, three years ago now, they're still very relevant um, and uh, connected to what's happening on the river and in our lives, um, what's happening in the world. It's it's not just uh, about the river. It's just about being human. Uh, something we should all be good at by this time, I would hope. But uh, <laughs> right. so this is um, relayofvoices.com. Is that the right website? That's right. That's right. It will go live on November 1st. And then at 6 p.m. that evening, we will have the uh, launch event on Zoom. So uh, we hope anyone and everyone will join us for that. And I will post the link in the show notes to register for that. Uh, event at 6 p.m. on the 1st. Uh, if you'll just 
remind send that to me again by email that I'll post that on the show notes. So when the website is live, then I just want to, you know, make sure that we're clear about this. So I'll be able to go to your website and watch interviews with um, the people that you met and talked with uh, along the, the whole trip. And I know that the first chapter is going to, is it going to be just the Headwaters region for the first chapter? So the first chapter is 16 different locations uh, along the, the Headwaters region. And uh, there are several voices contained, uh, different stories within that, more than 16 uh, different interviews. And um, you can navigate the whole river. Um, it's an interactive map that you can navigate. But you'll notice as you go beyond the waters region that the uh, locations will tell you coming soon or coming in December of 2022 or coming in February of 2023, depending upon where they're located. Well, I like the, the, the fact that it's kind of a gradual rollout, too, because there's a lot of content to absorb and, you know, I'll have some time then to go in and listen to stories from the Headwaters region and not feel like I have to rush through to get to the end of the river by a certain time. I can take my time getting to listen to the stories from each of these chapters and each of these regions and and have some time to kind of sit on it before I have before the next set of content is available. I like that. That it definitely is a lot of content. It's a lot of material. Um, and every story, you know, is very rich. Um, so I think it is a good uh, way to, to kind of take your time through it. And I think that like the river, uh, the stories become kind of not muddier, but more complex as you travel uh further and further down river. So just know that the headwaters, you know, Minnesota is so nice. Um, and most of the people and the stories we met there, um, you know, kind of have that quality. But as you get further and further uh, into the narrative, um, things start to get a little more challenging. And um, it's, I hope you'll keep uh, tuned in and, and keep reading as we release the, uh, the further chapters, you know, especially, you know, as we get into the dripless and the, the delta, um, all of the, you know, the chapters as we go further, um, there's just so much, uh, you know, depth in the stories and the, and, and then the overlaps that happen um, that you'll see coming out. Fantastic. I'm so looking forward to this. And, you know, and we've talked about this, you know, amongst ourselves before, too. But uh, I I get a little tired of the fact that there are certain narratives that are the only stories we seem to hear about the Mississippi, particular, uh, particularly in popular media. And if I hear one more story about people walking to Tower Rock, yeah, I think I'm I might break something. Uh, but uh but yeah, so I think that's one of the things that's going to be really special about this site is that there are going to be multiple, you know, hundreds of people who are going to be tell, talking about their relationship with the Mississippi, what the river means to them. And I hope people take time to really go through and listen to those stories and think about what it means about you know, our relationship with, with this big river. Me too. Me too. <laughs> so other than Relay of Voices, are there other places, social media, for example, where people can follow your work? Uh, yeah, we've got our website, houseunbuilt.com, which has a portfolio of all of my work, past and present. And then we're on social media, um, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as Relay of Voices. And then I am just as uh, V.E. Bradford. So you can find me there. And I can send you those links to include in the notes. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing your experiences with Relay of Voices. Uh, and I'm looking forward to this launch on November 1st and, and losing some time listening to stories about the river. Wonderful. Thanks, Dean. This has been great.
And now it's time for the Mississippi Minute. A few weeks ago, on a hike through an infrequently visited trail through Bottomland Forest, I found myself repeatedly dodging spider webs that spanned from tree to tree. These weren't just any spiders. They were big, about the size of the palm of my hand, and they lurked in the middle of webs that stretched four feet or more. I was pretty sure they were orb weavers, entirely harmless and not at all aggressive, but the sheer number and size of them creeped me out as I detoured around their silky traps. Those southern forests sure grow some enormous spiders. So naturally, I dug into researching orb weavers to settle my anxieties about them. Orb weavers are a diverse and ancient group of spiders. Scientists have identified nearly 3,000 species, and the oldest one probably emerged about 150 million years ago. Their bodies are often brightly colored, and they come in many shapes and sizes, from the palm-sized ones with spiky legs that I maneuvered around, to, thumb to thumbnail-sized creatures with geometrically shaped armor. Orb weavers are silk artists. They spin a new web nearly every day, starting the process by shooting a string of silk into the wind. After the silk attaches to another object, the spider crawls to the middle of the string and drops another line of silk to form a Y-shape. Then they go round and round to finish the web. When prey gets snagged in the threads, usually insects, but they have been known to eat small frogs and hummingbirds unlucky enough to get caught in their web, they paralyze it with a quick bite, then encase it in silk. Once their prey is dead, they vomit digestive juices on the body, then chew and suck out juices. By late summer, they've grown as big as they're going to get and turn their attention to mating. Male orb weavers don't spend much time in a web. Instead, they prowl around looking for a mate. All of those orb weavers I encountered were probably females. When a pair gets busy mating, it's usually the end of the line for the male. If they copulate for five seconds or less, the male might get away and survive to mate again. However, if the pair copulates for 10 seconds, which gives the male a much better chance to pass on his genes, that male is a goner. The female will eat him once they're finished. Female orb weavers then lay hundreds of eggs, and then they die. The little ones will emerge in the spring and start the process all over again. As to my anxieties, they really are unnecessary. Orb weavers aren't the least bit aggressive, unless you're an insect or a small frog. They flee when they're threatened. The only time people get bit, and their bite stings, but it's not venomous, it's when someone tries to handle one, which is something I will never be doing. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe to the series on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on future episodes. I offer the podcast for free, but when you support the show with a few bucks through Patreon, you help keep the program going. Just go to patreon.com slash Dean Klinkenberg. If you want to know more about the Mississippi River, check out my books. I write the Mississippi Valley Traveler guidebooks for people who want to get to know the Mississippi better. I also write the Frank Dodge Mystery Series that's set in places along the river. Find them wherever books are sold. The Mississippi Valley Traveler podcast is written and produced by me, Dean Klinkenberg. Original music by No Offense. See you next time.